Good evening to everybody. Welcome to Metzger and Swinton Astronomical Society. This evening, as you probably know, if you've read the details on our website, we have Dr. Susan Cartwright, currently at um, the University of Sheffield, or mainly, I think, near a home, <laughs> as she just said. Um, she did a PhD in particle physics at Glasgow University and worked in Hamburg, Germany and San Francisco before arriving in Sheffield in 1989. She's currently working on neutrino oscillations with the T2 experiment in Japan, which incidentally doesn't have any evidence that neutrinos travel faster than light. Though it does have evidence that accelerators don't much like earthquakes. So please, can everybody welcome Dr. Susan Cartwright. Thank you. Okay, so um, can everybody see my screen and does it have, does it, does it have my title page on it? Uh, yes, the uh, neutrino a history. Yes, thank you very much, good. Um, okay, so uh, the aim of this talk, as it says on the can, is to provide a, is to give you a brief history of neutrino physics and the gentleman um, on the title slide, most of them, the top row, have all won Nobel Prizes for work associated with neutrino physics. And the people on the bottom row should have shared the Nobel Prize with the people above them. Um, one didn't because he was dead, um, and the other didn't because the Nobel Prize committee are idiots. Um, <coughs> and, uh, I regret to say that they are indeed all men. The number of women who have won the Nobel Prize for Physics is um, deplorably small, although I would say that last year's one um, did feature a woman, uh, Andrea Gies, for her work on the black hole at the galactic center. So, um, so they are uh, occasionally managing to remember that they're in the 21st century and the, not the 19th, although not as often as they should do. Um, <clears throat> at least they're not all they're not all white males. Two of them are Japanese males. Um, <clears throat> so, um, without further ado, uh, so I'm going to divide this talk into three sections: the discovery of the neutrino, um, basically the neutrino in the 20th century and then the neutrino in the 21st century. And the idea of the neutrino started with that letter that's pictured on the right of the screen, which is in German. Um, and this was written by Wolfgang Pauli. And what it concerned was radioactive beta decay. Now, Radioactivity was discovered in the dying years of the 19th century. So in the 20th, in the early 20th century, it was a hot topic. It was the big new thing. Um, and alpha decay was, um, did have problems. In particular, it was difficult to understand how the alpha particle actually escaped from the nucleus because it didn't seem to have enough energy to do so. But at least once it had escaped, everything else made sense. The um, parent particle was slightly more massive than the daughter particle, daughter nucleus plus the alpha particle. And if you added up the masses and converted them to energy using Einstein's E equals MC squared, then that energy that you got was in fact the energy corresponding to the mass difference. So everything seemed to be working out fine. But when they came to look at beta decay, they found that all was not well. You would have expected that the beta particle, which they knew was an electron, um, should do the same as the alpha particle. It should carry away kinetic energy equal to the loss of mass of the system. But it didn't. As you can see from that plot on the top right, which, is, uh, which dates from 1927, what they found was that the B 
heat of particle energy, the electron energy, um, was not the same in in all well in all decays. Um, it always carried away less than the total mass difference, um, and for for each at each electron you got had a different energy. So you wound up with this continuous energy spectrum, which shouldn't which isn't isn't right because um you should have conservation of energy so where has this missing energy gone to and in addition to that it turned out that there was another problem which was that the spins weren't um behaving as they should that uh angular momentum so rotational momentum is another conserved quantity and um, there seemed to be missing spin in these beta decays as well. So this was a significant problem. I apologize for the screeching noises. That's my budgies um, trying to uh, hijack the meeting. Um, the, this was a significant problem. Now, this was the early days of quantum mechanics. And some people seriously suggested that perhaps energy conservation, like some other quantum mechanical things, was only true on a statistical level, and that this distribution um, was some kind of averaging out. But this was, most physicists didn't like this idea. Energy conservation is rather a fundamental thing. It reflects um, basically symmetries in space and time. And there's no good reason why it should be affected by quantum mechanics. So this was where Pauli came in. He was an Austrian theoretical physicist. And in 1930, he wrote a letter to a conference of, on radioactivity that was being held in Tübingen. And um, in this, he explained um, that in German, but this is translated, um, he explained that because of the wrong statistics of the nitrogen and lithium-6 nuclei and the continuous beta spectrum, I have hit upon a desperate remedy to save the exchange theorem of statistics and the law of conservation of energy. So um, this gives some impression of the fact that he thought this was a last resort, a desperate remedy. So what he did was he proposed that there could exist in the nuclei electrically neutral particles. The continuous beta spectrum would then become understandable by the assumption that in beta decay, a neutron is emitted in addition to the electron, such that the sum of the energies of the neutron and the electron is constant. Now, this wasn't the neutron that we know and love today. That hadn't been discovered yet. Um, Powell, the only things Pauli knew about his proposed particle was that it was electrically neutral, so he just called it neutron, basically meaning neutral object. Um, and the reason he regarded this as a desperate remedy is that in 1930, we knew of only two particles, protons and electrons. So basically, he was suggesting that the only way to solve the problem of beta decay was to increase the total number of elementary particles by 50% from two to three. So um, he really did consider that this was a serious um, issue, and he thought it was serious enough to do this rather drastic thing. You may ask why this was written in a letter, and he didn't go to the conference to present it. And the answer is, at the end of the letter, he says, um, I, I can't come to Tübingen because I've got to go to a ball. So that was purely a, um, a, a general conjecture. It wasn't anything very specific, just that there was some uncharged particle that was being emitted in beta decay. This was taken on board by the Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi, who is perhaps best known for being the first person to get a nuclear chain reaction going at the University of Chicago. Um, and he is responsible for the name 
that we currently give the neutrino because in 1932, Chadwick discovered a neutral particle which was similar to the proton. This was much too massive to be Pauli's particle, but it was uncharged. So Chadwick called it the neutron, neutral thing. So um, this meant that Pauli's particle needed a new name and Fermi being Italian, um, converted neutron, neutral thing to neutrino, little neutral thing. Um, and in 1934, he published a theory of beta decay. And in that he assumes, um, also in German, but I've translated it for you, uh, in which one assumes the existence of neutrinos and the emission of electrons and neutrinos from a nucleus in beta decay is dealt with in a similar way to the emission of a light quantum from an excited atom in radiation theory. The name photon hadn't been introduced at that point. Um, this theory was very successful and it became the basis of the modern theory of the weak interaction. So from 1934 on, neutrinos were sort of built into the theory of beta decay and the more general theory of the weak interaction. The problem was that the predicted interaction probability for neutrinos was very, very small. Um, and indeed, in 1934, following Fermi's publication of the theory, um, Hans Bethe, uh, later famous for developing the theory of stellar fusion, um, and uh, Rudolf Piles, perhaps most famous for um, writing a, uh, for his writing in, in physics, um, wrote in an article that there was no practical way to detect the neutrino. So we have this rather embarrassing situation, and Pauli was particularly embarrassed about this, um, that there was this particle, particle which was key to understanding beta decay, but which nobody seemed to be able to figure out how to detect directly. So essentially, it was an untestable assumption of the theory, which scientists are never very happy about. So fast forward 20 years, and we have Fred Reiners, um, who is a physicist at Los Alamos working on, um, on atomic bombs, basically. And in 1951, his boss gives him a year off to pursue fundamental physics. And he says in his Nobel Prize lecture, the months passed and all I could dredge up out of the subconscious was the possible utility of a bomb for the direct de detection of neutrinos. And the, way, the reason that this works is that when you have a fission reaction, such as uranium fission, um, you break the uranium nucleus up into two smaller nuclei and those nuclei are ri extremely rich in neutrons. They are too rich in neutrons for that nuclear mass. And so they, un they undergo beta decay with very short half-lives. And every for every beta decay, you get a neutrino out, and each uranium fission produces, on average, six or seven beta decays um, before the fission fragments stabilize. So uh, nuclear fission of any kind produces lots of neutrinos, and obviously a bomb is the most intense source of, nucle of, of neutrinos you can think of. So uh, Fred decided that um, a bomb would give him the opportunity, would provide so many neutrinos that well, there was a real possibility that enough of them would interact in a detector that you would actually be able to detect them. So he talked to Fermi, and Fermi agreed that a bomb would work, but he was concerned that in order to get a measurable um, flux, a measurable number of events from this, you would need a very large detector. Um, very large by the standards of the time was something of order of cubic meter, so something about the size of a typical office desk. And that seemed very large at the time because most particle physics experiments of the 1950s uh, were really small objects, you know, shoebox sized. Um, and Reiners agreed that you needed a cubic meter or so. He didn't really know how to build such a detector, but at a conference he met Clyde Cowan, and Clyde Cowan um, 
figure thought he knew how to build the detector. So they basically went to the director of Los Alamos and said, please, sir, can we have a bomb? Um, and the director of Los Alamos uh, said, yes, Fred, of course you may have a bomb. Um, and this is the schematic of the experiment they proposed to build. So here's your bomb on, on, a, um, on a test stand. This was, this was in the days when they still did nuclear tests in the open air. And of course, the problem with this is that you want your experiment close to the bomb to get lots of neutrinos, but you do not want it to be blown to bits by the bomb blast. So what you do is you dig a shaft, you, you line that shaft with a vacuum pipe, and you evacuate the shaft. So you um, therefore isolate your detector from shock waves because you've got a vacuum um, in between. But it would still be connected to um, by this suspension. So you actually, at the same time that you trigger the explosion, you trigger an explosive bolt. So you drop your detector. So at the time the bomb blast hits it, your detector is in free fall in a vacuum and totally isolated from its surroundings so it doesn't get blown to bits. Then a fraction of a second later, it hits the bottom of the shaft and gets blown and gets um, knocked into a thousand pieces. So you will see that the bottom of the shaft is supposed to be um, uh, filled with feathers and foam rubber to give the detector a soft landing. So um, this rather Heath Robinson-esque um, gadget uh, almost, uh, almost was actually built. As I say, they got permission to use a bomb. But at that point, they had a, an epiphany and they realized that the reaction that they planned to use, which was that your antineutrino captures on a proton and it produces a neutron plus a positron and you detect the positron straight away um, and the neutron wanders around a bit, bounces about and is eventually captured by a nucleus and that nucleus is excited by the capture and when it de-excites, it emits some gamma rays. So what you get is two bursts of gamma rays separated by a small fraction of a second. And this double pulse is very distinctive, so it gets rid of a lot of background. So because you have less background, you don't need quite such an intense neutrino source, so you can use a nuclear reactor rather than a bomb. And they wrote to Fermi and said, we've had this great idea. Um, and Fermi wrote back and said, yeah, I like this a lot better. For a start, you'll be able to repeat the experiment. Um, he obviously felt that um, if they'd gone to Los Al the director of Los Alamos and said, please, sir, may we have another bomb, um, they might not quite have got the same answer. So this is the principle from the paper. Here's your antineutrino coming in from the reactor. It hits a proton, that is to say a hydrogen nucleus in water. Um, and you get your positron emission, which then, not, because a positron is the antiparticle of an electron, it will very quickly meet an electron and annihilate into two gamma rays, and these travel out of the water. And surrounding the water, you have labeled one, two, and three in the diagram below. You have tanks of liquid scintillator, which, which you can use to detect the gamma rays. And the neutron wanders about a bit, bounces about, slows down, is eventually captured. To make sure it was captured, they dissolve cadmium chloride in their water. And cadmium has a very, very large appetite for neutrons. So it will capture on the cadmium. The cadmium then emits several gamma rays when it de-excites. And so you get these two gamma ray detections one after the other. So they tried this at a reactor in Hanford, and um, they got a signal that they were sufficiently convinced of that they, um, that they entitled the resulting paper detection of the free neutrino. But there was lots of background, so their signal wasn't very statistically significant. Um, and most of their background came from cosmic rays. So they tried again in, in 1955 um, with an improved detector and about 10 meters underground to reduce the cosmic ray flux and with a more powerful nuclear reactor at Savannah River. 
and um, they they checked their backgrounds. They checked that uh, the signal went away when the new when the reactor was powered off. They um, checked that when they took the cadmium away, um, the second signal went away. They checked that if they replaced their ordinary water with heavy water, which is much less susceptible to this reaction, that the reaction rate decreased. And so when they were convinced that they were really seeing neutrino interactions, they announced their result in 1956. So it took about 25 years from Pauli's first proposal of the existence of the neutrino to an actual experimental detection. So from the late 50s, the neutrino was definitely a thing. Um, and over the next 40 years or so, we gradually developed a better understanding of what neutrinos were and how they worked. Um, so in 1956, Reynolds and Cowan had demonstrated that reactor neutrinos, which are actually predicted to be anti-neutrinos, could be detected via this re reaction, anti-neutrino plus proton gives you positron plus neutron. And this is known as inverse beta decay because it's, um, it's e effectively uh, beta decay, but running backwards. In the meantime, a chap called Ray Davis um, showed that reactor neutrinos were not seen by this alternative reaction, which is that um, chlorine 37 can capture a neutrino to produce argon 37 plus an electron. And this one has to be a neutrino because you get an electron out, whereas the one above you get a positron out, which is an anti-electron, so you have to start with an anti-neutrino. So the fact that reactor anti-neutrinos um, could be detected using that first reaction, but they couldn't be detected using the second reaction, showed that the neutrino and the antineutrino were two distinct particles. The neutrino was not its own antiparticle. It was also known at this time that muons, which are unstable particles that are essentially um, overweight electrons, They're, they are very electron-like in their properties, but they weigh about 200 times as much as an electron does, um, they decay to electrons but it was proved that they do not decay to electrons by emitting a photon. So you can't get the reaction mu, uh, muon goes to electron plus gamma. And that strongly suggested that there were actually two types of neutrino and, so, and that the muon had to convert into a muon type neutrino. And so the electron that it was produced had to be balanced by an electron antineutrino to keep the total number of leptons, uh, electron like particles, constant, because antiparticles count minus one. And um, so, if this is true, then there are two types of neutrino one associated with the muon and the other one associated with the electron. If those two are different, then effectively that neutrino and antineutrino could annihilate and then you could get the uh, reaction muon goes to electron plus gamma, which we don't see. So in 1962, um, these gentlemen at the top here, Lederman, Schwartz and Steinberger, um, designed an experiment where they produced their neutrinos through the decay of an unstable particle called the pion which decays into a muon plus a muon neutrino. And they took those neutrinos from the pion decay and um, they uh, had a large detector, so some small fraction of these neutrinos would interact. And what they looked for was what particles were produced when those neutrinos interacted. And they found they always got muons, they never got electrons. So this demonstrated that the neutrino produced in association with a muon could interact to produce a muon, but it could not interact to produce an electron. And therefore, that there were two kinds of neutrinos. And um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this experiment 
Um, 26 years later in 1988, and that sounds like a very long delay until you realize that they got their Nobel Prize for showing there were two neutrinos before a Nobel Prize was awarded for showing that there were any neutrinos at all. And in fact, Fred Reiners didn't get the Nobel Prize until 1995. And uh, the reason that only Reiners got it, not Reiners and Cowan, was that Cowan had by that time died. Um, and uh, you don't get Nobel Prizes posthumously. So um, it took the Nobel Committee 40 years to decide that detecting the neutrino was worthy of a Nobel Prize. And did I mention the Nobel Prize Committee are idiots? Um, <coughs> So at that point, there were two neutrinos. 20 years later, things in neutrino physics seem to go in 20 year um, uh, intervals. Um, Marty Pearl, who's that gentleman there, whom I knew at Slack, um, discovered the tau lepton in data from the Mark I detector at Spear. And although the Mark I detector was a collaboration, I do credit this to Marty because from all accounts, um, Nobody else in the collaboration believed him, and he really had to fight very hard to get this acknowledged as being evidence for a new type of lepton. And basically what he found was that there were occasions where instead of getting an electron and a positron from your interaction or a mu plus and a mu minus, you got an electron and a muon. And he interpreted this as being a third heavier type of charged lepton which could decay either to a muon and two neutrinos or to an electron and two neutrinos. So sometimes you got one of each. And this immediately suggests that associated with this third charged lepton, which was called the tau, um, there should be an associated neutrino. But this would be difficult to demonstrate in the way that Lederman, Schwartz and Steinberger had demonstrated the existence of the muon neutrino because the tau lepton is extremely short lived. It only lives for a fraction of a picosecond. So that's, um, that's a, a million millionth of a second. Um, and so it's very hard to observe. And therefore it's difficult to prove that your neutrino is converted into a tau lepton because what you see is its decay products. However, the existence of the tau neutrino was indirectly demonstrated by the LEP collider in the early 1990s, I think 1991, if I remember correctly, which was almost 10 years before anybody managed to observe it directly. Um, and this was done by a cunning plan. Uh, the Z boson, which is one of the carriers of the weak force, can decay to a neutrino anti neutrino pair. The more different species of neutrino there are, the more decay routes it has. If there are two neutrinos, it, there are two different neutrino antineutrino pairs. If there are three neutrinos, there are three. If there are four neutrinos, there are four. If it has more ways to decay, it will decay faster, and so its lifetime will be shorter. But the uncertainty principle relates the uncertainty in energy with the uncertainty in time. So a short lifetime implies a large uncertainty in energy. And because E equals mc squared, therefore a large uncertainty in mass. And so if the, there are more neutrino species, the mass of the Z becomes more uncertain. And therefore, when you, um, when you produce Zs, they come in a range of masses. So if you um, scan through the mass, as you see in this bottom plot from 86 to 94, what you get is not a sudden spike corresponding to a single mass, but a, um, a smooth peak because the Z, has a, the Z mass has a finite um, uncertainty. And you can see that this peak is sharpest, the prediction, predicted shape of this peak is sharpest for two neutrinos and bluntest for four neutrinos. There are also data points on here, little red dots, and you can see that the green line, labeled three neutrinos, um, fits the little red dots perfectly. And so by this method, it was possible to demonstrate that there were three and only three types of neutrinos. OK. 
this does not completely um, solve the uh, answer the question of how many neutrinos there are, because the weak interaction has an unusual feature. It is, as the jargon goes, left-handed. Um, that means it only couples to um, left-handed particles and right-handed antiparticles. What we, what we mean by left-handed, it's the same sort of concept as a left-handed or right-handed screw. Um, if you think about the particles, they have a direction of motion and they have a spin. A left-handed particle, if you point your thumb in the direction of motion of the particle, then the curl and you, your curling of your fingers represents the direction of the spin of the particle, then a left-handed particle, that is right for the left hand. So if your left thumb is the direction of motion, your as you clench your fist, your fingers are moving in the direction of spin. Right-handed, obviously, is the other way around. And the weak interaction is only sensitive to left-handed particles and right-handed antiparticles. So um, this means that if you had a neutrino, which was right-handed rather than left-handed, the weak interaction would not see it, and therefore it would not affect the z-width. And, and we call these sterile neutrinos because they don't have consequences in detectors. And some anomalous results in neutrino experiments have been interpreted as evidence for such sterile neutrinos. And we'll look at this later, um, but I will say straight away that in my opinion, the evidence for this is weak. It's not very consistent. And if I were a betting woman, I would not be betting on the existence of sterile neutrinos. Um, hence my danger ahead sign um, on this slide. This is, in my view, um, not a very convincing property of neutrinos. So having counted our neutrinos and decided that there are definitely three, um, and uh, if there are more than three, then those additional ones are not sensitive to the weak interaction. The next question you might ask is, what is the mass of the neutrino? Um, Pauli, in his original letter, said that the neutrino mass should be of the same order of magnitude as the electron mass. Um, in other words, light, but he wasn't assuming super light. But even before the neutrino was discovered, it became clear by studying the electron spectrum in beta day, decay very carefully that this was an overestimate. So this first, these plot, this plot here shows the upper limit on neutrino masses. Uh, from 1950 up to 1993. And you can see that in 1950, and remember the neutrino was only detected in 1956, that people were already setting a limit of between 200 and 300 electron volts. And the electron mass, by contrast, is half a million electron volts. So it was already clear, even before the neutrino was discovered, that it was in fact much lighter than an electron. And all of these points come from studying the beta decay of tritium. That's the heavy, heaviest isotope of hydrogen, which has one proton bound to two neutrons. And this is the element that is most commonly used for these experiments. And the reason for that is that it's got a relatively short half-life, 12.3 12 years, which means that the number of tritium atoms decaying per second is quite high. So the number of decays you get to measure is quite large. And yet it has a rather low maximum energy, which means it's more sensitive to a small amount of that energy being taken by the mass of the, of the neutrino. So the principle of these experiments looks like this. You start with your tritium. Your tritium decays into helium-3, which is stable, and it emits an electron and a neutrino. You don't see the neutrino, you measure the energy of the electron. And that energy, as we, as we said when we started, started off, gives you this continuous spectrum. If you look right at the end of that continuous spectrum, you find that if 
the ele- if the neutrino is massless, then that spectrum will go all the way to having all of the mass difference between these two nuclei taken away as kinetic energy by the electron, and the neutrino gets zero energy and is basically emitted with zero, with zero kinetic energy. If the neutrino has a mass, then it must take away at least mc squared, um, and therefore this endpoint here would move, in this case, for a mass of one electron volt, it would move by one electron volt. The problem with this is that um, only a tiny, tiny, minuscule fraction of all decays, um, that's two times 10 to the minus 13, so that's um, that's two in 10 million million, um, would, would be in that last interval. So you need an enormous um, tritium source, an enormous number of neutrinos to be sensitive to this. It turns out to be easier to to measure, you'll notice that this blue line for zero mass is slightly higher than this red line for one electron volt mass. And because there is a lot more data in this part of the spectrum than there is in that little triangle, it turns out to be easier to look for this difference in the height of the plot of the curve close to the endpoint, but not right at the endpoint. So the principle of these experiments is um, very simple. You start with a tritium source um, as active as you can manage. You then have you then collimate your electrons so they're all going in the same direction. You then have a spectrometer which uses a magnetic field to separate to sort the electrons by energy, and then you have a detector which counts the number of electrons at each energy. So this basically measures this spectrum um, and you look for this difference in height between a finite mass and a zero mass. And um, the, this is getting a little ahead of our story because this is a modern experiment. This is the Katrin experiment um, at Karlsruhe. Um, and these, um, these spectrometers, in order to get a sufficiently precise measurement of the electron energy, they have to be huge. So this detector is, this whole detector is 70 meters long. So this, this thing here is about, I don't know, 20 meters or so long. Um, and if you look on the internet, you will find some very entertaining photographs of it being taken on a trailer th- through some tiny German village and just barely managing to avoid clouting the houses on either side. Um, the, it, where it was made is actually very, very close to Karlsruhe where it was installed, but um, they had to go an enormous long way around because there was a tunnel between the um, production site and the installation site that this thing wouldn't fit through. So they had to go all the way around the mountains. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is, so here we have, our tritium source here, um, and then you transport your electrons along through here. Then here you separate them by energy, and then there's a detector at this end which just counts the number of electrons you get. And the current, and they do not see any evidence for a um, a non-zero neutrino mass. So they set an upper limit of one electron volt, well, 1.1 electron volts. And as I said, you can compare that to the electron mass of half a million electron volts. And you can see that the neutrino, although it is not mass, we believe it is not massless, its mass is very, very, very tiny. Now, another thing that was happening while people were puzzling about the neutrino mass was that um, Ray Davis uh, on the left on that picture was starting to look at neutrinos from the sun. Reactors produce anti-neutrinos, but the sun produces neutrinos. And the reason for that is the beta decays, such as undergone by fission fragments, convert neutrons into protons. But in order to make hydrogen into helium, the sun must convert protons into neutrons. 
So instead of getting electrons and antineutrinos, you get positrons and neutrinos. And we saw that the chlorine reaction is sensitive to neutrinos. So Ray Davis, having failed to detect reactor neutrinos with chlorine, applied the same technique to measuring solar neutrinos, and he took a tank of cleaning fluid down a mine um, at Homestake uh, and um, basically tried to basically detected the argon produced when a chlorine atom captures a neutrino. And he successfully detected these neutrinos, which is quite a quite a feat actually, because you can see here um, on this plot that he's counting in a 60 ton tank of chlorine, um, the number, the argon production is me measured in atoms per day. And he was expecting to get something ar around the red line here. And that was predicted by John Bacall, who's the other guy in that photo, um, who, is the, uh, who was the theorist who um, developed the standard model of the solar interior and the fusion reactions that take place in the sun and used that to calculate how many neutrinos Ray Davis ought to see. And what you see is that what Ray, Ray actually saw was about one third of what he expected. And this is the infamous solar neutrino problem. And subsequent to this, various other detectors using different techniques successfully detected solar neutrinos, and they all also found fewer than they expected. The amount of the deficit was different for different experiments, um, but nobody saw as many as should be produced. So this was the solar neutrino problem. And to add to the solar neutrino problem, there was something called the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. And this was a similar sort of thing. Cosmic rays, which are part of energetic particles from outer space, um, interact with molecules in the upper atmosphere. And when they do that, they produce pions, which are unstable particles, and they rapidly decay to a muon and a neutrino. If they're pi minus, they decay to a mu minus plus an antineutrino. If they're, pi, if they're pi plus, they decay to a mu plus plus a muon neutrino. And those muons then also decay, as we saw, to an electron plus two neutrinos. So if you count up, you can see that for each pion, you should get two muon neutrinos and one electron neutrinos, neutrino. So when these interact, this means you should see two muons produced for every electron you produce. But what happened over the 1980s and 1990s was that people started to measure this and many experiments saw fewer muon neutrinos than they expected. So this is a plot of the ratio of muons to electrons um, divided by the expected number. So you should get one. And there were a number of um, detectors that were seeing something more like 0.5 or 0.6. Now, at first, this was confusing because there were also a couple of detectors, as you can see there, that were producing results consistent with one. And for a while, rather, it was um, the there were there are two ways of doing this, but there were two main designs for these experiments. One used um, iron interspersed with detectors, so the particles showered in the iron and were then detected. And the other used um, water Chankov counters, um, which used the fact that um, if a charged particle travels through a transparent medium at faster than the speed of light in that medium, you get a, the optical equivalent of a sonic boom. You get a coherent cone of light, which you can detect. So um, circa 1997, uh, your conclusion would be the muon neutrinos don't like water. Um, and this was uh, an embarrassment within the field, but it seemed to depend on what detector you used. Fortunately, um, in 1997, uh, and it, the Sudan experiment produced, which was an iron calorimeter, produced a measurement that was consistent with the water Cherenkov counters. And it just seems that those early 
iron measurements. They have very large error bars. And we were um, misled by the fact that the central value was close to one. Um, they were, they, this was just a statistical fluctuation. Um, and in 1998, there was a result by Super Kamiokande, which I'll talk about in a few slides time. So this was the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. Um, so if you were a neutrino physicist circa 1995, you had the following information about the neutrino. There are three distinct kinds corresponding to the three charged leptons, electron, muon, and tau. Um, we had seen in 1962 that the electron and muon neutrinos were distinct, and we had counted using the Large Electron Positron Collider at CERN um, that the Z decayed to three and only three um, different types of neutrino. We had also found out as early as 1960 that the anti-neutrino was different from the neutrino, that the, um, the chlorine experiment could detect neutrinos, but it could not detect anti-neutrinos. And we had also seen from several generations of tritium beta decay experiment that the neutrino appeared to be massless. And when the standard model was constructed in the 1970s, that was built into the standard model. It, the, the neutrino was, was um, incorporated into the model on the assumption that it was precisely massless. In uh, 1995, your neutrino physicist would also have some unanswered questions. Um, what's the explanation of the solar neutrino problem? In 1995, he would have asked, is the atmospheric neutrino anomaly real? Are these water Cherenkov results right? Um, and if so, what's the cause of the atmospheric neutrino anomaly? And is it really true that there are only three types of neutrinos, or are there more types which we can't see because they're not weak, they're not weakly interacting? So um, this was the state of play in the mid 1990s, and that started to change around 1998, um, which is close enough to the 21st century that we can think of this as the birth of the 21st century neutrino. And the first thing that happened was that in 1998, Super Kamiokande, which is that big water tank there, um, uh, which uh, you can see the size by recognizing that that's a dinghy with two people in it, um, published evidence that the deficit of atmospheric neutrino, muon neutrinos, not only did it exist, at higher statistics than had ever been measured before because Super K was a bigger experiment than anybody had ever built before. But it was also very dependent on direction. Um, the place where the muon neutrinos were missing was neutrinos that came into the detector from below. So these are plots of the number of events as a function of cos theta, and the left hand corresponds to upward coming neutrinos and the right hand side of the plot is downward going and in the middle there would be sideways. And you can see that for electron neutrinos, the, um, the data pretty much agree with what you expect, which is these hatch hatched rectangles here. For muon neutrinos, um, the data for downward going neutrinos look fine. But when you come to upward going neutrinos, um, half of them are missing. Now, you might think that, OK, that's not a problem. These neutrinos are being absorbed by the Earth. But this will not work because we know from many measurements using muon neutrino beams what the interaction probability for muon neutrinos is. And it's nothing like large enough. Your average solar neutrino um, or your average atmospheric neutrino, rather, can go through the Earth um, without even noticing that there was anything there. So if it's not the material of the Earth that is important, then what's left is the geometry of the Earth, that these interactions that produce the neutrinos happen in the upper atmosphere, maybe 10 or 20 kilometers up. So the ones that are coming down have traveled 10 or 20 kilometers to hit your detector. The ones that are coming up have gone through the Earth 
So they've traveled 12 and a half thousand kilometers. And so um, maybe the reason that these neutrinos go missing is that they have traveled a greater distance. And this may seem um, difficult to explain, but in fact, there was a pre existing theory that would produ produce exactly this effect. And this is known is the is the phenomenon known as neutrino oscillations. So neutrino oscillations arise from the fact that neutrinos come in three types. And so far we have talked about labeling them, those neutrinos by what um, particle physicists somewhat whimsically call flavor. That is to say the type of, of charge lepton they are associated with. So there's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. Now, assuming they have mass, you can also label them by mass. And this, the, this time, the labeling is rather unimaginatively mu1, mu2, and mu3. And all, that's all very well, because after all, we know that the electron, the muon, and the tau have different masses. But in the case of the neutrino, <laughs> the point is that these labels are not the same. If you have an electron neutrino, for example, it is a mixture of all three mass states. And if you have a mu2, for example, it is a mixture of all three flavor states. Um, and this is a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but it's um, it's a fairly straightforward thing to interpret. If you think of it, um, as you can perhaps see down the bottom, as coordinates, then you can imagine that um, if you think about, well, in, in, if you think from an astronomical perspective of a particular star, you can label it by its right ascension and its declination or you can label it by its altitude and its azimuth. The star's position has not moved, but its coordinates have changed. And if you have something that is exactly on the horizon, then it has altitude zero, but that doesn't mean it has declination zero. Um, and if you have something exactly on the celestial equator, it has declination zero, but that doesn't mean its altitude is zero. In the same way, if you have an electron neutrino, it is essentially um, on the electron neutrino axis, if you think of this as three dimensions, but it isn't on the new one, new two, or new three axis. It's a mixture. The key point is that that mixture can change. Um, in quantum mechanics, we can think of a traveling particle as a wave, and different masses correspond to different wavelengths. And what that means is that as your three mass states travel, they get out of phase. And there's a, an example on the bottom right for the simpler case of two mass states, that the darker um, wave has a longer wavelength than the lighter wave. And if, they, if this mixture here corresponds to a muon neutrino, then this also in the middle corresponds to a muon neutrino, and that at the right hand end corresponds to a muon neutrino. But all the things in between are different mixtures and correspond to some mixture of the muon neutrino and the other type of neutrino. And what that means is that your mass mixture is no longer a pure flavor state, and that means that if this neutrino interacts, there is some probability that it will do so as a different type from the type you started out with. And this could explain the atmospheric neutrino anomaly if we assume that some of our muon neutrinos, by the time they have traveled through the Earth, are have some probability of interacting as tau neutrinos. Not electron neutrinos, because you saw that the number of electron neutrinos matched our expectations. We didn't get an excess of upward going electron neutrinos. But Super Kamiokande finds it very hard to detect tau neutrinos, so they would just disappear, which is what you see. And you could also 
if you accept the neutrino oscillations happen, you could also explain the solar neutrino deficit by neutrino oscillations because the detectors that have been used for solar neutrinos up to that point were entirely or almost entirely sensitive to electron type neutrinos and not to the other two types. So we know that the solar neutrinos start out as electron neutrinos because they're produced in association with positrons. But if by the time they reach the Earth, they are some mixed state, then you would not see the ones that were interacting as muon or tau neutrinos. And in 2002, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada showed that this was indeed the case. If you could produce a detector that was sensitive to other types of neutrino, then you saw all the neutrinos you expect from the solar model. And they indeed had such a detector because although this was a water Cherenkov detector like Super K, unlike Super K, it was the water it was using was heavy water, deuterium oxide, not hydrogen oxide. And the reason it was in Canada was because the Canadian um, power industry used nuclear reactors that were moderated by heavy water, which meant that the Canadian Atomic Energy Authority had a strategic reserve of heavy water, um, most of which now borrowed five years. And the, if you have deuterium, hydrogen two, then um, if you hit it with a neutrino, you can transfer enough energy to break the deuterium up into its component proton and neutron. And any kind of neutrino can do that. Um, and in contrast, if you, uh, there is another way of breaking up the deuterium that converts the neutrino into an electron and converts the neutron into a proton. So you get electron plus proton plus proton. And that can only see the electron neutrino. And the other kind of detect the other kind of interaction that can detect solar neutrinos is when the neutrino scatters off an electron. This other neutrinos can undergo this scattering, but it's much easier for electron type neutrinos. So this is what Snow saw. Um, on the x-axis here, you have the flux of electron neutrinos and on the y-axis of muon and tau neutrinos and um, they saw the same low value that other people had seen for the red reaction here which is on the electron type neutrinos um, and they saw a low value for the green reaction which is mostly electron type neutrinos but for the blue reaction they saw exactly what they expected. The dashed lines here show what the standard solar model of John Bacall predicts. And you can see that their measurement is almost astonishingly exact. In fact, I was very relieved when they did a better measurement with more data and that blue band moved a bit so it wasn't quite so centered on the theoretical prediction. Um, and so what that shows is that the, the number of solar neutrinos is actually exactly what uh, John Bacall and his colleagues have predicted, it's just that they are not all electron neutrinos when they reach the Earth. So the idea of neutrino oscillations had answered two of the questions that your neutrino physicist of 1995 would have had, um, the solar neutrino problem and the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. Um, Neutrino oscillations can also shed light on the possibility of sterile neutrinos, because although sterile neutrinos cannot interact by the weak interaction, they can mix with the other kinds of neutrinos, so they can also um, get involved in this uh, mixing that is caused by the mass states going out of phase. Um, neutrino oscillations are sensitive to the mass, but they're only sensitive to the difference in the squared masses, and they are not sensitive to the sign of that difference. Um, the atmospheric oscillation gives a squared mass difference of 2.5 times 10 to minus 3 electron volt squared, and the solar 
oscillation gives a squared mass difference of 7.4 times 10 to minus 5. And of course, if you only have three states, you only have two independent differences, um, the difference between m3 squared and m1 squared has got to be the sum of or the difference of those two, some more difference because we are not sure of the signs. Um, but there were some experiments that gave hints of much larger delta m squared, and that would require additional neutrinos. And because we don't see them in the z width, they have to be sterile neutrinos. And so um, <laughs> there is quite a large industry of theoreticians um, interpreting anomalies in neutrino experiments as evidence for sterile neutrinos. However, <laughs> it's very different, difficult to put all the results from different experiments together and get a consistent picture. And more recently, um, other experiments have not seen any such effect and basically rule out most of the suggestions. So on this plot, um, these contours here show um, signals that have been interpreted as sterile neutrinos in terms of the squared mass difference and what's called the mixing angle, which is basically the content, the, um, the fraction of this type of neutrino that's in a given mass state. And um, so all the, these closed contours here, the green ones and the blue ones, uh, are results from different experiments that claim to see an effect. One problem that you can see, this red curve here shows they're attempting to make a combined fit to all the available evidence. And you can see that the region allowed is tiny because these experiments are not very consistent with each other. And the other problem is that this recent experiment, this recent result from a combination of the MINOS experiment in the US and the Dia Bay experiment in um, France, and old data from Bouchy, which is a French experiment, ruled out any, any, all of this plot that's to the right of that red line. And you can see it comprehensively rules out um, all of these suggested results. So um, this is all looking um, very messy. And as I say, if I were a betting woman, I would bet that all these anomalous results will turn out to be inability to calculate our systematic errors and not to be a real signal at all. Um, another slightly embarrassing episode, which some of you will no doubt remember, was the, um, was the faster than light neutrinos. Um, according to special relativity, uh, E equals, if, if you have a stationary particle, E equals mc squared. If you have a moving particle, then the total energy, including the mass energy and the kinetic energy, is given by mc squared divided by the square root of 1 minus beta squared, where beta is the speed of the particle divided by the speed of light. And this has two consequences. One is that if you have m equals 0, the only way to have non-zero energy is to have beta equal to 1, which gives you zero over zero, which is a non, which is a not a well-defined um, mathematical operation, so it can give you a finite number. Um, so what this tells you is that any massless object must travel at the speed of light. Um, indeed, the speed of light in relativity theory is not really the speed of light; it's the speed of a massless article, massless particle. And if it were to turn out that photons had mass. They would then light would travel less than the speed of light, if you see what I mean. Um, the other thing that is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, because that will give you beta greater than one, which will give you a square root of a negative number on the denominator of that expression. So in view of that, it was very disturbing when uh, 10 years ago, the Opera experiment reported evidence that neutrinos travel faster than light. Um, the OPERA experiment was taking neutrinos from CERN and detecting them at an underground lab at Grand Sasso. This is a distance of 732 kilometers. They, they should take about two and a half milliseconds to travel that distance. And they were taking 61 nanoseconds less than, the, than expected. And that 
corresponds to traveling faster than light, not by very much, by about two parts in 100,000, but nonetheless, that thing has the wrong sign. Um, and it has the wrong sign to a high statistical significance. So there was much excitement and somebody from the Guardian rang me up at six o'clock in the evening in my office and asked me for comments on it. And I'd never heard of it. So I was I was frantically Googling it with one hand while telling the chap on the telephone. Well, you know, um, systematic errors in neutrino experiments are very difficult to calculate. So um, I wouldn't hold my breath on this one. Um, and in fact, when I looked into it, um, obviously, in 1987, there had been a much longer baseline than 732 kilometers neutrino experiment, and that is supernova 1987A. Um, the baseline of super, uh, supernova 1987A is 156,000 light years, plus or minus 3%. The Large Magellanic Cloud distance is one of the better known distances in astronomy. And this is an event from which we detected neutrinos. So this is a picture, well-known picture of the supernova. Um, and this is a plot of the neutrinos, which were detected clearly by two detectors, Kamiokande and IMB, and somewhat more um, sparsely by a smaller Russian detector at Baksan. Now, the timeline goes like this. Um, we know what this star was. This star was a blue supergiant called Sanduliat minus 69202. And it had apparent magnitude 12. And it had, a, had apparent magnitude 12 since it had been ca catalogued by Sanduliak in the first place. Um, and at 2.20 universal time on the 23rd of February 1987, um, somebody took a photographic plate of the Large Magellanic Cloud that showed Sanduli at minus 69202 at magnitude 12, where it had ever always been ever since anybody had looked at it. Five hours later, um, at 7.35 and 41 seconds, the IMB neutrinos, the, um, the red ones, were observed by the Irvine, Michigan, Brookha Brookhaven experiment um, in a mine in America. Um, the ones from Kamiokande were at a similar time, but less precisely known because IMB timestamped their events with GPS and Kamiokande didn't. So their time is uncertain to a minute or so. Um, at 10.38, so three hours later, um, uh, McNaught took a photographic plate, which was, when developed, showed Sanduli at... Um, minus 69202 at magnitude six and a half. So that's um, about a factor of 100 brighter than it normally is. So this is clearly the explosion already underway. Um, it wasn't because in those days, of course, you took photographic plates, which had to be developed. Um, it, this wasn't the image on which the supernova was discovered. It was actually discovered um, sometime later on the 24th of February by Ian Shelton, by which time it had reached magnitude three. And it was one of the very few cases of a discovery where having seen it in the observatory and wondering whether it was real, they were able to check on it by going outside and having a look. Um, <clears throat> but what this timeline tells you is that the neutrinos arrived not more than three hours before the light, which gives you beta minus one less than two times 10 to minus nine. If they'd uh, been traveling at the speed that the opera experiment implied, they'd have got here four years before we saw the light. Um, so uh, there's a big difference between three hours and four years. Um, and in fact, we expect neutrinos to arrive early because neutrinos escape from the explosion before the light does. Um, now, these are much lower energy neutrinos than operas neutrinos. So some um, theorists tried to produce, uh, tried to explain this by claiming that the speed depended on the energy in some weird and unconventional way. But the results were decidedly unconvincing. Um, and so, in fact, within a couple of months, it became apparent that um, opera were not seeing faster than light neutrinos. In fact, their time measurement had been uh, distorted 
by a bad connection to their fiber optic cable. So, oops. Um, I was quite pleased about that because I gave a talk to the department in which I said that, I, that um, this was probably wrong and it was probably a mistake that could only be found by climbing over the experiment and looking at it in detail. So, um, hey, I got it right. I wasn't quite as brave as Jim Al-Khalili, who apparently said he'd eat his box of shorts on live TV if this turned out to be right. Um, so the final thing I want to tell you about is neutrinos and antineutrinos. And there are two questions that relate to these. We said in our, our neutrino physicist of 1995 would have been pretty convinced that neutrinos and antineutrinos were different. But the fact that the weak interaction is so sensitive to spin direction produces another possibility. Um, they could be really distinct, like the electron and the positron, definitely different particles, or they could only be distinct spin states, um, since the weak interaction would then interact with the left-handed state as if it were a particle and the right-handed one as if it were an antiparticle. And this is theoretically possible for uncharged particles. And in fact, um, this theory was first worked out by the Italian theoretical physicist Ettore Majorana, and the particles are called Majorana particles. Um, so that's one question. And the other question is, regardless of whether they are distinct particles or only distinct spin states, do they behave differently? By which I mean, if you take a neutrino interaction, you swap all the particles for antiparticles and you reverse all the positions and velocities so you reflect the thing in a mirror. Does the resulting anti-interaction have the same properties as the interaction or does it not? Um, and if the answer is it doesn't, then that tells you that it is possible that neutrinos may uh, help to explain one of the great mysteries of cosmology, which is why our universe contains only matter and not a 50-50 mix of matter and antimatter, which is what you get when you create particles in accelerators. Um, and we can address these problems. Uh, the question of neutrinos and antineutrinos, we can look at through a weird phenomenon called double beta decay. Um, if you have a, uh, an, a particle, a new, an atomic nucleus that contains an even number of particles, total um, protons and neutrons, then it turns out that because the uh, protons and the neutrons like to pair up with their spins in opposite directions, um, the nuclei that have even numbers of both protons and neutrons are more tightly bound and therefore have lower masses than the nuclei that have odd numbers of protons and neutrons. So for example, the nucleus with 33 protons and 43 neutrons is less tightly bound than the nuclei on either side of it. And this gives you an unusual effect that usually with these so-called isobars, that is to say nuclei of the same atomic mass, they beta decay um, cascade down until they reach the bottom of the parabola. But in this case, you can see that this chap here um, which is germanium-76, can't decay to the next one up because it's got higher mass than it does. So that would not be energetically possible. But it would like to decay to selenium-76, which is two units across. Um, and it can do that by a legitimate but extremely rare process of double beta decay, where it manages to convert two of its neutrons into protons simultaneously emitting two electrons and two antineutrinos. And this is a very rare process because the weak decay is rare to start with and you need two of them. And this process has been seen and measured and it has a half-life of 1.9 times 10 to the 21 years, um, which is 19 with 20 zeros after it. And to compare and compare that with the age of the universe, which is 1.4 um, times 10 to the 10 years, and you see that it's um, 10 to the 11, so that's 100,000 million times longer than the age of the universe. Um, so to all intents and purposes, this germanium isotope is stable, and you find it in natural germanium, but we have actually, with very sensitive experiments, seen it decay. 
Now, if the neutrino is massive, and if the only difference between neutrino and antineutrino is spin, then in principle, this can also go without the neutrino emission. You essentially cancel off these two objects here because in this case, uh, if the neutrino, if the only difference between neutrino and antineutrino is spin, then you could reverse the spin of one of these and make it a neutrino instead of an antineutrino and then annihilate them. So you can get, if this is the case, um, neutrinoless double beating decay where you get the two electrons but you don't get the neutrinos. And this can only happen if the neutrinos are Majorana particles and the rate at which it happens depends on the effective mass of the electron neutrino. So this is both a method of measuring mass and a proof that neutrinos are Majorana particles. So there are a range of different isotopes that can do this. Most of them have been studied by one experiment or another. The standard model, two neutrino double beta decay has been measured for a number of isotopes, um, but nobody has seen the neutrino -less double beta decay. And here are three experimental results. This is from the experiment Gerda, which uses germanium-76. Um, this is the two neutrino double beta decay process, which is well measured. Um, the zero neutrino double beta decay will produce a peak here where the blue line is, and there aren't any events where the blue line is. Um, this is Kamlan Zen, which is using Zenon 136. And again, you expect a peak here, and you don't really see one. This is Kuore, which uses Tellurium 120. This is where the peak ought to be, and if anything, they get a dip there. They get a peak here, but that's background cobalt 60. Um, so nobody has seen a signal for neutrino loss double beta decay, and the limits on the half-life are now approaching 10 to the 26 years. So that's um, 100,000 times longer than the measured two neutrino double beta decay lifetimes. Um, finally, uh, Looking at this asymmetry, the difference between neutrino and antineutrino behavior, and this is the experiment I work on myself, T to K, we use a beam of neutrinos that's produced in an accelerator, and we can tune it to get either neutrinos or antineutrinos. So we can directly compare neutrino interactions and antineutrino interactions. And we do observe a difference. The uncertainty is still too big to claim a discovery. Particle physicists are very fussy about how, how accurate, how far away your measurement has to be before you can claim that you've discovered something new and we haven't reached that. But um, here are a couple of plots um, for different assumptions about the ordering of the masses. The red line is where you would expect to be if matter and antimatter were symmetric. The point is where we are. Um, and the inner curve represents a 68% probability that it's not outside that inner curve. And the outer curve, there's a 90% probability that it's not outside that outer curve. And you can see that the, the sym symmet symmetric situation is rejected at more than, with more than 90% probability. Um, so we don't have the five sigma that you need to claim a discovery in particle physics. But we're still taking data. So more data from us and from other neutrino experiments like NOVA may be able to confirm this within a few years. And if not, the next generation of bigger and better neutrino experiments, which are expected to start about 2026 or 2027, will certainly do so. So there is a real possibility that neutrinos may, may be the key to how our universe looks today. So to summarize, Neutrino physics offers a unique window on the fundamental properties of matter and perhaps a window on the most basic properties of the universe itself. And what's interesting is in the last 25 years, what we knew about neutrino physics has basically been turned upside down. And your neutrino physicist in 1995 knew that there were three distinct kinds of neutrino corresponding to the three charged leptons. This is wrong. There are three types, but they're not distinct. They can convert into each other because of oscillations. 
1995, he knew that the anti-neutrino is different from the neutrino. Well, the jury's still out on this one. But if it's true that neutrinos are Majorana particles, then this is in some respects not the case. Um, in 1995, it was still believed that the neutrino was massless. This is wrong. At least two of them definitely have non-zero mass, even though we don't know the exact values. And the unanswered questions that we had in 1995, the solar neutrino problem is solved by neutrino oscillations. The atmospheric neutrino anomaly was real, but it also explained by neutrino oscillations. We still don't know if there are sterile neutrinos, but the open window is narrowing as more experiments take better data. So um, that's where we are today. Um, and the question is, who will get the next Neutrino Nobel Prize? Sue, thank you very much for uh, an excellent talk. Can I ask you to stop sharing your uh, screen, please? Certainly. And we're all back. That was a very comprehensive talk, Sue. I think I'm going to have to go away and uh, think about a lot of what you've said. Uh, yeah, a lot of detail in there. And uh, the idea of these particles actually uh, morphing into or exchanging places in the oscillation uh, is quite a different, difficult concept to, uh, to get your head around. Uh, we're going to come to questions. Uh, and just while people are thinking, uh, Going back to the original uh, neutrino experiment of dropping, dropping a, a or exploding a bomb and having a detector nearby, obviously, obviously that thing, that sort of thing, wouldn't happen today. But have any of your experiments, or do you know of any modern experiments that have been turned down just because of the health and safety reasons, or just because simply it's a bad idea? Um. I, I don't I, I don't think we've had any that have been turned down because it be for, for that kind of reason. We do um, there have been a couple of cases where experiments have been shut down because of health and safety um, breaches. There, in fact, a new a neutrino experiment called Borexino um, in the Gran Sasso exper um, lab uh, in Italy was shut down for about two years because they managed to leak liquid scintillator into the groundwater, which is a bad idea. Um, and, uh, but they are, they're actually running now and producing good, good data, but, um, but their, their safety precautions were not all they ought to have been cracked up to be. Um, and of course, many neutrino experiments operate down mines, and certainly um, there, there are technologies that nobody even thinks about suggesting because the mine directors would take one look at the um, at the material you were proposing to put down their mine and go, ah, not in a million years, no, go away. Um, <coughs> uh, I remember doing a viva for a PhD student once and it became apparent that he thought that the homestake experiment, which is always referred to as the chlorine experiment, was actually a tank of chlorine gas and I think that definitely comes under the category of um, if Ray Davis had said to the mine owners, I want to put 60 tonnes of chlorine gas in a pressurised tank down your mine, he would have been told rather rapidly what to do with his 60 tonnes of, of, um, of chlorine gas. In fact, it was dry cleaning fluid, which is, um, uh, I think the one he used is C2Cl4. Um, so plenty of chlorine, but a much more uh, in a much less dangerous form. <laughs> right. OK. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am looking for questions. Uh, have we got any hands? Uh, yeah, Vic Gunn. Can you unmute yourself, Vic? Yeah, is that okay? That's fine, Vic. Can we have your question, That's... please? Yeah. Susan, um, right at the beginning, when you uh, I, I showed how neutrino probably first thought of neutrinos because of the uh, apparent loss of uh, energy and angular momentum and you mentioned the, the spin of the particles now i've always thought that the the spin of a particle was best thought of as just a 
um, quantum feature and not try and uh, associate it with a, the normal concept of, the, of spin. And I wonder how angular momentum linked in with the, the, the quantum spin of a particle. Um, yes, it is um, best thought of as a as a quantum number, um, but it is actually a quantum number that behaves in all respects as if it were a small quantity of angular momentum. Ah, so whatever it is, it is conserved. Yes, whatever it yes. is, it is conserved. <laughs> it does behave. It does behave like angular momentum. Thank you. And in fact, you can convert from spin angular momentum to orbital angular momentum. So in, in some atomic transitions, um, you do that. It's, it's called spin orbit coupling. And it's, um, it's a fairly uh, well, it's a mathematically well understood phenomenon. I'm not sure it's conceptually well understood phenomenon. Because, um, as you say, uh, the temptation of, is to think of it as a little billiard ball spinning frantically. And that doesn't work because um, in particles, the unit of spin angular momentum is a half h bar. And that actually means that um, the thing has to go through 720 degrees rather than 360 degrees before it returns to its original state. So it's clearly not, not spin as we know it, Jim. You know, it's, um, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's weird. But it, as I say, it does seem to interconvert with more conventional angular momentum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vic. And I am uh, looking for other questions. Tony, can you unmute yourself, please? So j just picking up on the test paper, <laughs> are there any good uh, lay person books that kind of cover what you've just covered? Uh, Frank Close. Um, Frank Close wrote a book called Neutrino, and um, and he's he's always a good bet for clear explanations. Right. Thank you. Okay, Tony. Thank you. Yeah. Catherine, you've got your hand up. So uh, can you uh, unmute yourself, please? Uh, no, this one's slightly off topic, but I've heard that. Uh, causal set theory can actually predict the value of the cosmological constant in natural units. Has anything um, progressed with that? Really, um, the, uh, the cosmological constant, which might not be constant, um, is, uh, is one of these things that um, nobody understands it. And the problem with it is that um, we don't know enough about it to be sure that claimed predictions are actually real and not spurious. Um, I mean, I, um, back in the day, um, Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, towards the end of his life, became obsessed with large numbers in cosmology and claimed to have predicted that his large number theory predicted the value of the fine, con of fine structure constant at 130, of 1 over 136, which at the time was in good agreement with measurements. Um, but we, we now have a better measurement and it's not 1 over 136, it's 1 over 137.0 something. Um, and, it's, uh, and so um, that prediction, which, um, I, which looked as though it was, um, it, it in some sense validated his large numbers hypothesis, it turned out with better measurements to be wrong. And in the same way, because our uncertainties about the nature of dark energy are so large at the moment, um, I, I wouldn't want to take any sort of numerological prediction seriously until we have particularly better data about its time evolution, because at the moment, everybody treats it like Einstein's cosmological constant. But in many, um, in many theories, uh, beyond the standard model theories, it does actually vary with time. And there are future satellite experiments that would give us more information on whether or not it does evolve with time. And um, until we know that, 
I, I'm not sure that I would be that confident of any sort of claimed agreements with the experimental measurement that we have at the moment. Okay, I'm thank an experimentalist. You. I um, I have a an ingrained distrust of theorists. I'm, I'm not going to comment on that at <laughs> all, <laughs> Susan. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, we've worked you hard enough this evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, leaves me to ask everybody to give Susan a big Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society. Thank you for a wonderful talk. <laughs>